Hey there, internet friends. Welcome to another episode of That Nerdy Site Show, a weekly podcast where the team members from That Nerdy Site get together to talk about our lives and all of the nerdy things we love about them. I'm your host, Trevor Starkey, and joining me this week, we have Logan Wilkinson. How you doing, Logan? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Trev? Doing all right. We uh, we had a, a nice little check-in kind mm-hmm. of uh, before we started recording on kind of yeah. what's been going on in, in the uh, the day-to-day lives, and, and uh, sounds like we're both doing all right. Obviously, we yeah. both had uh, a little bit of uh, some... some you know, personal hardships here and there uh, mm-hmm. in in uh, in the last couple of weeks, but seems like we are both bouncing back. So uh, yeah, uh, it was. Uh, it's always nice to kind of be able to check in with you and um, and kind of touch base on that kind of stuff outside what? of just like, hey, let's talk about a whole bunch of nerdy. Things you <laughs> like, what I'll say is that it's the running joke for me is that me and Trev record a podcast usually at least one weekly, sometimes more than one. And I'm always like, all right, so it'll probably be like, and usually it's for music. I'm like, it'll usually be about like 45 minutes, an hour, you know, don't worry, Shrav. Like it's going to be, we're going to be quick in and out and it'll be done. And then inevitably <laughs> three hours later, I walk out and I'm like, all right, so that one got away from us. And it's just every week. Uh, so it's nice to say, like, I always enjoy our chats, Trev. Um, it is always a joy to talk. And in Texas today, in Austin, Texas, it is beautiful it is perfect it's like literally i'm looking at the window right now blue skies and the cloud in the air it is like a perfect texas day and it's actually surprisingly not hellaciously hot well we we're keeping that uh it's like 115 here, right yeah here in phoenix we had yeah i want to say like i saw on my facebook feed uh that yesterday was 117 degrees which yeah. like ties the record high in august uh for for the phoenix area <laughs> it's like yep uh, and and I definitely have felt it the last uh, last couple of days when I've gone out to like go grab lunch or something like that. I saw um, Cam, yeah, yeah, like, Cam, tweet out, Cam basically like, the entire week was just one fifteens. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was it, like I as as you were like, oh, it's beautiful here. I checked like my weather app and it's like, yep, <laughs> 100, 113 is the high today. One hundred fifteen, one hundred thirteen, one hundred thirteen, one hundred eleven. One like we don't get in, under one hundred and ten until next Friday. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, and, See, and, we're the, getting, and the lows yeah. of the lowest of the week is 88 degrees. So, like, it's That's, it's a low of 90 almost the whole week. We're we're barreling towards that. It's still it's nice right now. It's gonna be nice today, and then starting on Tuesday, every day is at least 100 um, for the high um, that we're kind of hitting. So we're gonna have a week straight of triple digits. So mm-hmm. we're coming up on you now. Then. Well, enough about your Southwest weather report here. <laughs> uh, if you like what you hear, you can always uh, like, subscribe, rate, review, share the podcast with friends, all that fun stuff. And if you're feeling extra generous, you can always support us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash that nerdy site. Uh, let's dive right on into kind of some of our, our topics of the show. Obviously, we're doing just a, a little uh, two-hander today. Um, but Logan, one of the things you wanted to bring to the table is uh, a game you've been playing, uh, thanks to mm-hmm. our friends over at Pop Agenda for providing mm-hmm. this, uh, the Alto Collection. Uh, yeah. tell me about Tell me about the Alto Collection. Yeah, so I thought this would be a really good game to kind of have a conversation in terms of our coverage for it. Um, the Auto Collection is basically like an endless runner, mm-hmm. um, but you're skiing or snow. I think it's skiing, technically, um, down just kind of an endless mountain. Uh, what is nice about it, I think, as just like a small detail, is it has like a day-night cycle that just kind of slowly transitions. So you get to see like kind of the golden hour and then it goes like pitch black and then kind of come back around again and... Um, the game itself is beautiful, but the premise is basically is that you're just trying to kind of rack up a high score, um, see how like further and further down the mountain you can go, um, unlock kind of the goals they have, right? Like they'll, they have levels and each level, um, has like three different goals attached to it. And by levels, I don't mean like different maps. I mean like as you like level up in the game to kind of go up to the next level. Um, and that's, that's in essence, the game. Um, Mm -hmm. The Alto Collection is two different games. It's the original one, and then Alto Odyssey, I believe, is the second game. Um, And it's it's an interesting game for me because I feel like the person that I know who would enjoy this game the most, I've already seen tweet out his impressions that that they did over at IP. Um, And so I think... It is a game where you can just kind of switch off. Um, one thing I kind of have like my, my pros and cons I wrote out here that is like a weird pro but also kind of a con is the game is super chill. Like it is very laid back. They have like great kind of 
um, melodic music attached to it that just kind of really like just sinks you down into like this warm like wrapped blanket. Except for the fact that I wish that when you did crash, because when you crash, like you left to like reset the whole level again, and like that's when your score kind of gets tallied up um, after just one crash. I wish that they had a mode that is just kind of you just keep going. And they do, you have a mode where you can't just kind of go forever. And if you need to crash, it doesn't matter. You just keep going and going and going. But it doesn't have a score attached to that. And that wouldn't necessarily be a problem. But, like, it doesn't restart you when you crash quite quick enough, right? Like, I, I would love this game was as fast as, like, Super Meat Boy, right? Like, where you crash, your score pops up, and then you can immediately just, like, restart again. But it's, like, a bit... There was, like, two or three menus you have to kind of go through. And it just takes slightly too long for how easily that you can crash and like restart the whole thing Mm -hmm. um so that is kind of i think one of my bigger critiques like just kind of the load time in that um that's unfortunate because yeah effectively for those that don't know this is basically a pair of mobile games that have been combined into a collection now that have been ported to consoles and pc Mm -hmm. right yeah so yeah so it seems like it seems like hey yeah that's understandable if that was like how you encountered it on your phone or something like that. But it yeah. seems like with the extra, you know, processing power of like a- any console or PC, it seems like they'd be able to get you in and out quicker. Maybe um, so that's, and, that's unfortunate. And maybe it's just because I've played a game like Super Meat Boy so much where it is like Super Meat Boy is one of my favorite games. I love that game. And like that is just so like you immediately are going to get in that level. And this one is just like a bit kind of slower in getting you there again. Um, I think another... Another complaint seems like a weird word, but, like, I guess it is, like, I wish there were other places that you kind of go, right? Like, certainly in the first game, like, you were just going on the same mountain. And, again, like, it has a day-night cycle, so it's, like, kind of lit up differently, and there are colors to it. And, like, the mountain is, like, procedurally generated, so, like, it looks different every time kind of thing in that essence. But, like, it is, at the end of the day, like, the same mountain, Um, and I wish it had like a few different kind of locations you were going down a mountain at, um, in terms of like what you're looking at in the background. Um, but I also recognize that this is a mobile game and that all the levels are procedurally generated set probably took a lot of their kind of bandwidth, but that's kind of a minor critique. But in terms of the, the pros, I mean, this game is gorgeous. Like this game is absolutely beautiful. And like, there are certain moments where, like, you're, like, skiing down, like, kind of a sheer mountain cliff where I'm, like, this game looks so much like a journey. And, like, even down to the fact that we're, like, as you kind of rack up more and more combos and kind of do more and more moves and get your score higher and higher, your scarf will grow longer and longer and longer, <laughs> um, which seems like kind of a very unabashed homage to that. And it is just stunning. Like, it is very evocative journey at moments, like, kind of, especially, like, in the golden hour times of day where it is just like this beautiful, like kind of autumnal colors and golds everywhere and these kind of ruby red scarf that you have. And it is just so beautiful. And like they all kind of work off of the white snow that kind of over time becomes kind of a goldish looking even because of the way the sun is setting. And it is just so breathtakingly beautiful. Right. And they have kind of cool touches where at night, certain things you can kind of grind on, will be wrapped up with, like, Christmas lights, and they'll turn on, and so they'll like, kind of have these, like, green and red Christmas lights and, like, the blue darkness around you, and it is a very beautiful game, which I think is, for me at least, in the list of mobile games I've played, I think one thing they tap into really well is doing really cool, unique, aesthetically beautiful styles. Like, they can, I think they are more open to experiment with, like, what, of the visual style of the game is and i think the auto collection definitely does that like it's just very visually pleasing which i think ties back into just the music and what you're doing isn't necessarily that complex like there are at essence like two buttons basically you have to like jump and then there's another button and that's about all you really need to do again going back towards mobile roots and so it just makes for a very chill experience right like i'm playing this in <laughs> the dead of summer which I I would think is not maybe kind of what it is evocative of, but, like, I can very easily imagine playing this game on my phone or on my PS4 come, like, December, right, and, like, being wrapped up in a blanket, and I would say looking at the snow outside, but looking at, like, the 50-degree temperatures outside and really just enjoying that, right? Like, it seems like that kind of game. 
Um, and then another thing is, despite it not loading back up as quickly as I want it to, maybe this game is very replayable, right? Like, and it might be just my own competitive nature, which is already kind of heightened by Fall Guys. But like, every time, like, <laughs> I want to see how much further down the mountain I can go, or how much higher I can get my score, or you know, they have like this this one really dickish enemy. It's like the only enemy in the game who like will chase after you with like. I think it's like a reindeer is what it's supposed to be. Um, after you get to a certain point and trying to like maneuver past him and not get hit by him and like the little like stick thing he has. And it, it just makes you want to go a little bit further right, and do a little bit better. Um, and I know I've already compared it to the game a lot, but it seems really apt for this comparison of like Super Meat Boy. Um, and it's just a game like that, that, I think gets under your skin a little bit and like wants you to play it a little bit more, right? Like it is a weird game. The fact that like, it's both a perfect, I'm going to play for 10 minutes and be done real quick. Cause I have 10 minutes to play a game real quick. And also I'm going to play for 10 minutes and suddenly two and a half hours have passed. Um, like it just really gets its hooks in you once you start it up. Um, so yeah, I mean like it's a really fun game. It's, it's really good. Uh, I don't, <sighs> It is. It's not perfect, many means. Um, it is very simple because it is a mobile game. But like beneath that kind of, I think, simpleness to everything and kind of the intuitiveness of the controls, is something that is a lot deeper, right? And you can really get really crazy with like kind of the moves you can do, the combos you can do, and the backflips in the air and all that kind of stuff. And it is, I think the weird hybrid mashup that I kind of think of when I think of this game is a mixture of like a journey in terms of visual style, super meat boy in terms of kind of this endless thing that you just kind of keep going back again and again and again to get a better score and to kind of finish. And then like Tony Hawk per skater, but for skiing and like, imagine all this blended together on a mobile game and you have this uh-huh. and it's fun and it works like the review score I would give it would be like a seven. I think like it is the definition of like, this is a good video game. Like mm-hmm. this is this is very much that, um, like you could put as much or as little into it as you want. Uh, I actually talked about this before with you a few days ago. It was like I still can't make up my mind on whether or not I think you would like or not like this game. Right. Um, but it is one that I think is definitely worth a try, um, even if just for a little bit. The trophy list is not the trophy list isn't hard. It's, like, one that is very much, like, you just have to play it for so long that, like, I probably won't end up getting the Platinum, um, especially because, like, you have to basically play it for so long for both of the games um, to get, like, the individual Platinum, because, like, basically just, like, half the trophies are for the first one, and uh-huh. then the exact same trophies are it for the second game. Um, so I'll probably get, like, half the trophies ultimately um, and then not do the same thing again. Uh, but it is fun. It is a very good video game. Um, and at the very least, like, if you're ever like, I don't know what to play, I don't know what to play, I don't know what to play, this to me is like a game like Super Meat Boy is for me or like Spelunky is for some people or Fall Guys apparently is becoming for Trevor where you can just kind of pop it on and just <laughs> enjoy yourself for a little bit and just have a good time. Yeah. As uh, yeah, I'm looking back through our, our our messages on this, and you were like, I can't decide if I think you'd find the game super chill and relaxing or frustrating as you go yeah. for the higher score. Yeah, honestly, not sure where I'm at to be fair. Ha ha. Yeah. And uh, and I, uh, my response was basically like, from what I've seen of the trailers and the the uh, the art style, I think it's absolutely like a beautiful game. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the 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 high score, endless runner, isn't really like my cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, and not that. Sayonara Wild Hearts is an endless runner, but like Sayonara Wild Hearts is is one of those that like I immediately jump on of like I love the visuals of that game and I love the like the music of that game so much so that like I was just like I want to listen to Sayonara like so I downloaded the uh, the soundtrack this last week and was just like enjoying that, but like the gameplay of it and the the hook of like trying to three star thing or or get the highest score possible just isn't really up my alley or like I have to be in a very particular like mood to try and hop in like that. Um, but yeah, like I, so, so this one when, like when the, uh, the like, Hey, do you want to like cover this game? I had kind of like, I looked at it. I was like, that looks really cool. Checked out the trailer. I was like, Oh, not doesn't really look like it's, it's 
probably for me. Um, yeah. But I'm I'm glad uh, I'm glad you've enjoyed uh, the time that you put into it. Um, yeah, uh, and definitely like yeah, it's it is definitely one of those like again looking at screenshots as you've been talking about it. Um, it's it's incredibly like a visually stunning and beautiful game. Mm-hmm. Um, it mm-hmm. it it evokes. Um, uh, I don't know if you ever played Fez, um, uh, but only it has, very little of it. But yeah, yeah, it it, it like Fez was uh, obviously I think a lot more pixelated um, yeah. than this, but like the the things they were doing with like the design and the background uh, of that, like it looks like a mashup of Fez and Journey, like you're kind of uh, referencing there. So, mm. um, uh, very very stunning looking game. Yes, um, and and especially like to think about like playing that on your phone or on mobile or something like that. It, it's almost like a a two D Monument Valley design. Mm. Yeah, um, that's a good of, yeah kind of philosophy as well there. Um, the, but yeah, the, just uh, yeah. The final thing I'll say is is definitely, I mean, I agree to your point of like, I definitely wish this was in an endless runner, right? Like, I would definitely wish that there were ways to like get to the end of the level and get like see what my high score was there and like just build it up from there and that they had like five different maps that I was playing or like 10 different maps I was playing um, and like actual kind of like levels like a Tony Hawk Pro Skater or Super Meat Boy. Um, like that would, I would think definitely be my preference, but with what we have, I, I enjoy it. In terms of like endless runners I played, this is definitely one of the ones that I've enjoyed the most. Yeah, and that's even uh, you talking about like, oh yeah, you're doing you're you're skiing down, you're doing tricks or whatever, uh, and trying to rack up a high score. It got me thinking of um, I put in a ton of time into Ollie Ollie Two. Um, wow. Okay. Right. Right. And it's like it's one of those things like, like that is not at all my kind of game, um, but it I put so much time into it that uh, until now Fall Guys and and some of these might have changed, but like I was looking at my PSN profiles this last week. Um, and like a whole bunch of like the high end Fall Guys trophies have like become like my most rare trophies. But mm. before that, like a lot of Ollie Ollie Two trophies are like the rarest trophies I have on PSN profiles because yeah. like I did like I went in and did every trick in the book kind of thing, and like very few people were doing that. And like the reason it's rare is because like a shit ton of people downloaded Ollie Ollie Two because it was a PS Plus game, but just like they didn't. Not many people put that put as much time into it as I did. Yeah. Um and and even that, like Ollie Ollie too, like I really enjoyed for the brief window that I played it, but it was like a level based kind of thing. It wasn't an mm-hmm. endless runner where you're you're constantly going downhill and doing tricks. It was like, okay, you gotta figure out the best route through this course and the best tricks to, you know, grind off the right things and all that stuff. Versus an endless runner where it's like and because it, it's is it also procedurally generated? Uh yes. Yeah, all the levels. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, it's like, it's, there's, there's not really like, you can't come up with like a best strategy for a thing because it's going to be different every time you hop in. So you have to, you have to more like act on the fly and it's like, Mm -hmm. you could, you could just luck into a great run versus, you know, you like versus a a skill based thing, if, if that makes sense. So, uh, but that's, it's another thing that like another game comparison I thought of, uh, as you were kind of describing, it was like, Oh yeah, it's, it sounds like that at least, even if it's not perfectly that in execution, it sounds like there's maybe enough of an Ollie Ollie kind of vibe in there, um, for for some of these things, especially with the like Tony Hawk pro skater comparison. I think as like a pivot point too, because now I was curious, I looked up my piece and profile, for my rarest trophies, they are my rarest one is from Super Meat Boy, which is not shocking. Um, mm-hmm. But after that, it is from Velocity Two X, which reminded me, Velocity Two X is a fantastic video game. Everybody should play Velocity Two X. It's really good. Absolutely is, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, slight transition over to me in in, uh, in speaking of Fall Guys kind of territory. There, um, I I am continuing to play Fall Guys. Uh, I am I I came the closest i have come to that god awful win five <laughs> such a in a row trophy oh my in god. that i got to a fifth uh a fifth final like i i got four straight wins mm-hmm. and i got to the final round and it was a fucking hexagon round which is probably my weakest of the it is it is the one i'm least consistent in uh, in winning final rounds on and i so I, I i tweeted this out the other day but it was like i had now that so they added Jump Showdown is now one of the new final rounds. Um, in the I know, I saw I had, that when I was editing your piece. Yeah, yeah I, had, I had two Jump Showdown wins in a row, followed by a Hexagon, which was a full game of Hexagon, like 18 people or whatever, like the max of <laughs> people you can get in Hexagon. So it was just like utter chaos. And I was like, 
like when it came up, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm getting this. And I got that crown. I was like, oh, my God. Then I got a uh, Fall Mountain win. So that was Mm. my fourth. And it was my first four in a row. So I was like, oh, my God, is this going to actually happen? Am I actually going to going to make it through this? And I got to the final round again after like back to back team games where like I think it was like Hoarders and then Egg Scrambler or something like that, where like I had game saving like knocking a ball onto our side or getting a golden egg in uh, in our thing right at the end to like beat the buzzer and not get eliminated so i was just like oh my god like this is this is like everything like i the the ideal run would be none of these team games uh where like i'm at risk because other people are going to screw me out of this but i made it and then hexagon came up and i was like no 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 why hexagon again i almost never get like back to back hexagon wins um but I, I was like, all right, just just breathe, just try and do it. And then I got like eliminated like fifth out of nine or something like that. I was like, no, fuck you, fall guys. Um, and and so that is the closest I have come in getting that win five games in a row trophy because that's the only trophy I still need at this point. I, I you know, max leveled. I've got I I've got like legendary of you know a whole bunch of stuff. So I got like all of the you know the cosmetic trophies or whatever. Um, I have completed and, and you know, uh, I, I've bit like one of the trophies, like be first in like 20 rounds. Of I was games. just I, looking at like, that one. Like, I've probably hard, been, yeah. I've probably been first in like 20 rounds of dizzy heights alone at this point. Um, just because I've been playing the game so much. Uh, and then like qualify from 500 rounds. I got that on like Monday or something like that. So I've, I've played a shit ton of fall guys. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and the only thing I need at this point is that five straight wins trophy for the platinum. And it's just like, yeah, that's that's probably not going to happen. But yeah, right now my my five rarest trophies on PSN profiles are uh, my my ultra rarest is head turner, which is basically where like legendary gear, like upper lower, uh, uh, mm. uh, like pattern and uh, whatever the other thing is, um, uh, color, like where like legendary versions of all those. So I've I've got those because I've got I've racked up enough. I've probably probably somewhere in the 40 to 50 wins range at this point um and so i've just been able to use a bunch of those crowns i picked up this morning um on the shop uh enter the gungeon uh legendary Mm. is in the shop uh as a as a costume so you can basically be one of the bullets and i was like cool definitely gonna like get that right away so i can just hop into a round and be like yeah this is my big dick energy of course i've got enough wins to, (laughs) to have this thing uh here it's in the same way that i uh the the jacket from hotline miami costume that that came out you know last week or something like that um i, I was I, I run around with that as a as another kind of like main gear to because it's like it's it's the weird status symbol that you get in these kinds of games um yeah. uh, uh just to be like yep I, like this is this is what i'm at um so yeah head turner and then fall guy fashionista which is basically buy 50 cosmetic things um, star of the show, which is like B level 40 and then veteran status, which is win 500 rounds. Those are my f- four of my five rare trophies. And then my fifth one I love cause it's like a super easy trophy to get. If you play the game, you just have to actually actively go and get it. Um, uh, but it's a quiplash two uh, trophy from Jackbox party pack. One of the, or like something, something. Um, and it's basically like answer, um, like uh, uh, write gravy castle as an answer and win a battle with it and like it's it's super easy to achieve if you just play the game like by yourself on two devices or something like that mm. but like i uh, like i saw that i was like oh, i can get that one and just like did it one day and i was like yep there we go and so it is my fifth rarest trophy with a with only like a two point six percent um uh achievement rate um so so yeah but yeah everything else at this point is uh um, is absolutely like Fall Guys rare trophies, just because I've been pouring so much time into that. But then, yeah, number six is every trick in the book from Ollie Ollie too, um, uh, and uh, and then a couple from yeah, like Super Time Force Ultra and uh, and Ollie Ollie too, which again, both of those were like highly downloaded um, and played uh, PS Plus games, um, just like Fall Guys is, which is why like there are probably more people that have these fall guys trophies with me but like as a percentage of the actual player base Mm -hmm. um it's it's racking up there but uh right before we started recording uh, i hopped in for 
think four games so far this morning i won my first one and then i won the one right before we started recording so i'm, I'm I, like i'm two for four for the day we're gonna and, we're definitely gonna play this whenever we get off this episode now because i gotta i gotta i'm looking got, at these trophies i gotta rack up these trophies got it gotta get some some fall guys trophies yeah uh, that um, and the other one i saw looked on my list now is ultimate chicken horse we have to get back to that so i can platinum that game yeah, uh, Ultimate Chicken Horse, absolutely a, another great fun one. But yeah, Fall Guys, uh, I'm still having a ton of fun with it. I am, so uh, y- you mentioned that you you edit a piece. I have a piece that is like 99.9% ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, with, that is just going to be, it's my ranking of the uh, the Fall Guys. Some uh, disagreements and rounds I and have stuff. with your... That's uh, absolutely, absolutely fair. Um because it is like absolutely like person, and they're like as I as I am playing it more and more, I'm like, yeah, this game is just getting more and more annoying for me. So I might even like shift some of the the rankings around a little bit more before we publish. But the only reason I haven't published it yet is because I spent six hours yesterday trying to get the last screenshot I need because I want basically the loading screen screenshot for each of the mini games, and I can't fucking get into a game of Royal Fumble again to save my life, and it's infuriating. <laughs> I, like, it was... I, I played literally probably six hours yesterday just trying to get <laughs> Royal Fumble, and it's one it, that they when they patched the game last week, they, like, as... I don't know if it was, like, critic like, response to player feedback or something, but they did, like, drop the... They lowered the the spawn rate of that as, like, the final game. And I'm like, I don't, like, fine, I get it, but give me one of them in, like, six <laughs> hours of making it to final rounds or something. Because it's just, I'm like, I just, I just want that one last screenshot so I can save it, put it on a USB stick, throw it into this article, and, and have the article ready to go. So we'll see if I get that today, and if so, the article will be up Monday by the time you're hearing this episode. But who knows at this point? But that is the one freaking, like, one I need to get. And, like, cause especially because I was, like, I, I made a list of all the games in a in a notes app at some point and was, like, hitting the screenshot button. But I didn't realize that, like, I – apparently I was hitting the screenshot button and, like, you have to actually make sure it's, it takes the screenshot and you get the little notification of, like, screenshot saved or whatever because um, I, I clearly did not get that before checking off that I had the Royal Fumble screenshot. So mm. – when I uh, when I unloaded all of those uh, for the first time, I was like, "Why am I missing like six of these games?" Uh, but I was able to get the other five yesterday, and I'm just waiting on that goddamn Royal Fumble to get, hop back into that game again. So, but yes, um, and that in particular may also be like lowering the ranking of Royal Fumble because it, it is delaying the publishing and posting of this article. But it's uh it's going to be a ranking of uh my, like just my personal dumb ranking of all these things, which uh, of course you know. Is, is constantly in flux, um, but then also little uh, tips and tricks to uh, to let, that kind of just are my strategy for, um, you know, how I do well in some of these levels. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, but, yeah, that'll be coming soon. Again, at this point, I really have no idea if I'll ever get this five wins in a row trophy. It's, um, I, I'm, I would legitimately, like, they have to... That trophy's insane. It's, it's, it's a pain in the ass. I hopped in... Uh, earlier this week with uh, uh, the nanobiologist and uh, Tucker something I don't know his last name because um, uh, they've been there are a couple people that have absolutely fallen down the fall guys well like myself and and Tucker in particular um, hopped on and was doing a stream with um, what's good games like mm. the week the game came out and like on that stream alone he got two four in a row wins um, like he was just dominating throughout that stream mm. with them because they were all playing together. Um, and when I hopped in with him and, and nanobiologist, um, uh, earlier in the week, he, uh, admitted that he got his fifth win in a row, like last Saturday or something like that. So he has that trophy and probably at this point, the platinum, if he didn't already have it when, when we were playing and I was just like, fuck you, Tucker, fuck you. Yeah. But he's also where I picked up like a lot of my strategy from for some of the levels. So I'm like, I, you know. I get it. He's just really good at that game. So shout out to him and shout out to him like lucking into five straight rounds where he was able to pull off the victory. Um, Cause yeah, I've, I've just not been able to do it yet. And it's, it is like, I, I was, as I was picking up those, those four wins in a row, I was like composing the tweet of like, Oh my God, if I actually fucking get this, I am sending this tweet. <laughs> And then when I like got screwed over at, at I was like, well, I can still use the, most of this tweet, and it just has has a has, has a tragic ending now instead of yeah. an exciting one. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just like I like 
I'm still really enjoying it. And even when I like, even when I lose a lot of time, I'm just like, all right, like I, I applaud the, the skill of whatever just happened to like the, the guy, you know, who beat me in hexagon clearly outplayed me or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, I just, you know, it like the game is just a great blend of like skill and utter chaos that you can't account for, <laughs> uh, like like a, a round of hexagon with fifteen people, where it's like, well, I'm doing the slow hop method four levels up, so I'm doing good there. But everybody who fell below me has taken out everything underneath me. So if I like have one slip up or something like that, and there's just nothing below me to catch me, I'm like, well, I like I did as best as I could with what I had at that point. <laughs> so you know, who cares? Whatever. Uh, you're you're into the next round quick enough that mm. it's still fun, and and yeah, like I still have a ton of fun. I, I tweeted this out uh, right before we hopped on in the in the round that we were playing that I ended up getting the win on. Um, fall Fall Ball uh, ranks very high on my list as like one of my favorite mini games in there because it's basically just Rocket League but with Fall Guys. Um, and we the team I was on got off to like a pretty good start. It was like a five v five kind of match or something like that, and. Uh, so we were up like three or four to nothing. And then I just kind of like stood there at like center court and just was heading balls in. And I just slowly watched the other team start just quitting out of the game being like, fuck this. We're too far behind. There's nothing we can do. And it got, we got to 16 to nothing before the last guy popped out and it just was like qualified and moved on to the next game. I was like, Hey, people have been saying like, there needs to be a mercy rule. Cause I've been in plenty of games where it's like, well, we're up 10, nothing. I just feel bad at this point, but I'm also just going to keep practicing like my headers <laughs> to to just keep working on that skill. Uh, and so yeah, we we got to 16 to nil, and uh, and I was like, well, yep, I guess the the de facto mercy roll is if everybody else quits because that was the first time that it happened for me. <laughs> it was mm. where where like because I always actually very much applaud like the people that stick with it, yeah, um, and and try to you know like even if they are. Yeah, like their team the rest of their team has clearly abandoned them like they're trying and and uh and and you know sticking with the game um but also like i can fully understand the the frustration of being that far down and being like well there's really no point in me wasting the other 30 seconds of this i'm just gonna bounce and start a new game so um but fall guys real fun still but also fuck that five wins in a row trophy that's just <laughs> that's just so infuriating um and seeing like like, because I was looking at it on PSN profiles and, like, seeing the first people that won it, won it clearly, like, before the servers were stabilized or whatever. And so I don't, like, they were able to, like, rack out, rack up some of those. And then just, like, the, and this might have been, like, a just a delay in updating Fall Guys, but, like, the last time I had checked it, it was, like, the person who had most recently won the thing was like 12 hours ago or something like that so it's like it's clearly not a trophy that's just popping especially given the amount of people that are playing it's it is a you have to just be incredibly lucky mm. um to to nab that one so fuck that trophy <laughs> and and it will be the bane of my existence unless i ever get it and then it will be my most prized trophy ever <laughs> mm -hmm. it will supplant the witness platinum uh, which is currently like the the one I'm like most proud of because of the final that challenge in that one. Um, like most of the trophies in that one are are doable, especially like if you use a guide or whatever, um, which I did not. But like you can use a guide for a lot of them. But there is a final the final challenge trophy on that one um, is a randomized um, timed set of puzzles that you have to solve. You have to I want to say it's like eleven puzzles that you have to solve within like a two and a half minute span of time and it's completely randomly generated each time so like um it it took me a week of like solid three hours a night trying to get that trophy before i finally popped it and was like yes fucking i'm done hooray <laughs> um and uh and and if i ever get this fall guys platinum that will basically be a a more uh a more proud accomplishment for me than that one um, so that's me. Uh, that's me and Fall Guys. My my Fall Guys update there. Um, let's throw it back over to you. Uh, you've been watching. You've been watching a couple of movies there. I've been uh, seeing some cinema out here, folks. Um, yeah. Yeah. I in my continual journey to watch Star Wars again, not for the first time. Um, but I rewatched. Uh, Attack of the Clones. And Attack of the Clones could be the one that I've seen the fewest times. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I would say either Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. I've seen Phantom Menace so many times, um, but I have not seen Attack of the Clones as many. Uh, and my letterbox quest to rank and review all these movies, it is currently the last place film. Um, my best description for Attack of the Clones would be Phantom Menace feels long. It is long. It feels long though, and there are lots of there are lots of dry patches where like not a lot is happening. It feels kind of drawn out, um, and it's it can be boring at times, or not boring, but like a little slow at times. But it's got these great moments of action every now and again yeah, too. It, it's, it's got the pod race. It's got Duel of the Fates. Exactly. Attack of the Clones is like if they took the parts that were just slower um and drier in phantom menace and then they got rid of the action-packed parts right like nothing really works as well and like visually i think i like to look at it more than phantom menace maybe i would certainly get more colors to it at the very least but the most exciting thing in the movie might be there's a part where like obi-wan and anakin are chasing after the bounty hunter Mm -hmm. um the one that Django Fett hired um and that happens like 10 minutes into the movie and that might be the climax of the movie um in terms of action (laughs) and a lot of that's the action high point yeah yeah um because like at the end of episode one we get this awesome three-person duel duel the fates is kicking it's lit and here we get an 80 year old Christopher Lee fighting Obi-Wan for like 10 seconds and then he wins and then he fights Anakin for like 20 seconds and then he cuts off Anakin's arm and wins and then Yoda comes in and it's like why is this duel choreographed and done this way and the answer of course is because Christopher Lee is an 80 year old man and he can't have a lightsaber duel in the same way and maybe we shouldn't have made our villain in this movie Count Dooku maybe we shouldn't have killed Darth Maul do you know how we know this probably because we bring him back five years later but like (laughs) either way um I think I mean, that well, like I appreciate the argument, but also like, I mean, they could have still had stunt people coming in, and and, and they did absolutely they did. have stunt You'd... people coming in and being Count Dooku. So well, that's it's like, the problem. It's not with... a great it, it, like, it's not a great reason. It's more the I, I would say the the bigger issue is that they decided to make half that major duel a completely CGI Yoda who's just flipping all over the place. Well, not like it, the problem with the duel is the fact that. To your point, they do bring a stunt double on, but like they have, they like basically like CGI Chris Release face in the stunt double as like they're doing the shots, and so and like it doesn't look right. And so what they end up doing, especially for when it's him fighting Anakin, is they have I can't remember who one of them cut basically like the wires for the lights, and so everything is suddenly dark except for the lightsaber blades, and they do extreme close ups on Anakin and Count Dooku's face so that you can't see their bodies. And it's just them, like, waving the lightsabers around, basically. And it's like, this is such a lame... Like, out of the... In the entire pantheon of... Certainly of, like, the original saga of six films. But I would even expand it to, like, all nine movies. This is probably the worst lightsaber duel in them all. Just because, like... It doesn't really have the emotion of the Vader-Obi-Wan duel from episode four. Which isn't, like, an amazing duel. Because they forgot how to do it. But, like, at least, like, there are consequences. We've been building up to this, like... There's a lot in that aspect of it where it's like here, we don't, we, like, we we literally don't even see Count Dooku until, like, three quarters into the film. Like, he gets introduced so late into the movie, and I still don't really have a reason to, like, dislike him other than because, like, he's in charge of the Separatists. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I guess. Like, and, like, he just seems like a nice old man. Sure. Like, he's all right. And so, like, I don't really have a reason for, like, to be che- like I don't have a reason other than like I like Obi Wan and Anakin to cheer for them to win, um, and like he doesn't really seem particularly menacing, and it's it's just a weird ending. And the arena fight is kind of cool, where like Obi Wan and Anakin pad me like escape and like fight the giant monster beast, and like that's kind of cool, but it's just lacking really any big action set piece, um, and I, and I think they very much course corrected it in episode three, which has so much action. Um, like I'm, I'm eager to see how it holds up now, but like that movie has so much shit happening in it. Uh, but episode two, it's just weird. Like there's so much promise and potential with these characters and with that time period, because Clone Wars shows us that I think both Clone Wars series, I guess I should say shows us that. 
Um, but it's done not great here. What I will say as a positive for Attack of the Clones, because people don't talk enough about the good things about Attack of the Clones, is I can definitively say now, having watched it again as a 28-year-old kid in 2020, the writing is not amazing by any means. Like, it's probably the least well-written Star Wars movie that George Lucas had a hand on. But it is also not as bad as people, I think, make it out to be. Right, like, it is. It was weird watching, being like, you know what, this movie's not as poorly written. Like, the dialogue's not as bad as I remember it being, and like, remember like people talking about it. Where it's like, it's not great again, to be clear, but like, and it's like definitely like probably the poorest written George Lucas Star Wars movie. But like, it's still not catastrophic like other movies I've seen have been. Like, like I was watching, being like, that's un- that's like, I roll shrug, that's bad. But like, it's not like I was ready for like it to be real bad. And I watch him like, okay, yeah. I mean, this is, it's not great, but it's fine. And I actually think that, um, Natalie Portman and Hayden Christensen's performances aren't as bad as they're made out to be, which again is also just like people being hyperbolic on the internet, of course. Um, and me also having seen Hayden Christensen be a great actor, the things being like, yeah, he's talent. Like he's not working with the best stuff, but like he's making it work. Um, the Padme Anakin love story, Still doesn't work. It didn't work in 2002. Doesn't work now. Um, yeah. It just, that happens very quickly. But like on the whole, it's like, this is going to be the bottom spot out of the kind of original saga of six movies. Um, Cause like, I know that I will like episode three more. Um, it is my favorite prequel movie. Um, so it's going to be the bottom, but like, it is still one where it's like, if somebody was like, do you want to watch Attack of the Clones? I would not just be like, no. Nah. I'd be like, I mean, yeah, like we can, I'll, I'll watch Attack of the Clones. I'd be like, we can watch other Star Wars movies, but like, I'll, I'll watch Attack of <laughs> the Clones, like for sure. Like, I think, and this is like kind of a weird comparison to make, but like also not like the closest analogy I can kind of give to it actually is that it feels like the Star Wars movie that is most like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which maybe is a backhanded compliment. I don't know, but like, I, it I mean, feels I don't like, think that's a compliment, period. So. Yeah, it feels like one where it very much, like, they're trying to kind of, I think, echo what made, in this case, the original trilogy special, but, like, they just don't quite, I think, have a handle on it, and they also try to be, like, a few different movies at once, right? Like, I think Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, they tried to kind of, they had, like, five different things they were trying to do, and so it didn't really work, and I think here, like, they're trying to do like a few different things and so like none of them really work that great. Um, and I do think having said that this is not the worst Star Wars movie. Like there are other Star Wars movies that I think are worse than this one. Um, like I would rather watch attack of the clones than I'd, than I would want to watch solo. Um, because I think solo is not a great Star Wars movie for me personally. That's, everything in Star Wars is very divisive now, but for me personally, right, and, like, I'd rather watch this probably than Episode Nine at the very least. Um, but, yeah, it's fine. Um, it can it furthered the story of the prequels, right? Like, it is interesting watching it again where it's like, you know, like, these movies might not be the best in the prequels, but, like, they are telling a cohesive story, and that is refreshing to watch from a Star Wars trilogy after whatever the sequel trilogy ended up being at the end of that. Um but there's enough of that. I also it's, watched. It, it's oh, you definitely have a made. I, I was gonna say it's definitely made better by the fact that like we have the Clone Wars. Yeah, for sure. Um, like for sure. As a yeah. result of as a result of that, but, like the Clone Wars as a series makes the Clone Wars movie better. Yes. Um, I think it makes uh, the prequels better as a whole. I mean, yeah, absolutely. But like in in particular, like because the Clone Wars series basically is is everything that happens between yeah. the end of two and the beginning of three, effectively. It's like, okay, like, if you only had the, like, the Clone Wars does a great job of rehabilitating all of the characters mm. in Attack of the Clones yeah. um, and and giving them so much more depth than yeah. George Lucas had time for yeah. um, that that it's like, okay, I can, I can better appreciate, you know, the Hayden Christensen Anakin yeah. because of the James Arnold Taylor Anakin or no James Arnold Taylor. I think it was Obi-Wan um, whoever plays Anakin in the, um, in the Clone Wars series. Um, 
like I, I can appreciate like I can better appreciate that and Mace Windu and mm. and like Obi Wan was like Ewan McGregor was fine. He's, he's, the, he's been the best the character time. in the prequels. Yeah, like, I mean, like yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, the 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 introduction to everything else to flesh out, you know, everything else that goes on during that era, I think is is the the biggest boon that the Clone yeah. Wars gives us. Yeah. Um, and and just like like it's weird because I also am somebody who thinks that Rogue One makes a New Hope better. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, for and sure. A New Hope, I would agree. A New Hope was already good. Yeah. Um, if not great or you know excellent or whatever, but like Rogue One, like just gives you enough information and enough mm-hmm. like little extra backstory to just make moments in a new hope punch better. Yeah. And so it's 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 like that's that is the best kind of like this era of like fan made canon that we're getting. Mm. Um uh in in the same way that like I loved uh and I want to say like the first example of this that I can really like remember was the Muppet movie that Jason Siegel worked on because like he was just such a clear diehard Muppet fan and so that was like the first instance I really looked at of like the people who grew up with this and loved and cherished this stuff now getting to take the reins of the thing Mm -hmm. um uh and, and and like really knocking it out of the park was that um and so you get that with like the Clone Wars kind of coming up and and you know taking and and building on and you get that with Rogue One taking and building on um, Star Wars um, and for my money you get that with Mandalorian as well. Mm, um, yes, but I know I know I some people are are hit or miss on Mandalorian, but that's interesting. Um, well, okay, yeah. Um, Did you ever finish Mandalorian? Nope, so I haven't. Okay, so so that 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 pro- that plays a large role into probably why why you because uh, a sure. lot of people like it's it, they it's thought. The 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 like the latter episodes of Mandalorian, uh, like they thought it came out with a pretty good bang, and then it kind of like petered out a little bit by the end. But I disagree with that. But that's that's the like the general internet sentiment on it. I guess. Um, I will say that it's interesting for me for Attack of the Clones where because like this is one everything everything from Phantom Menace onwards. I have very vivid memories of being in the theater watching. Mm-hmm. Um. And so, like, it's interesting because I think me and you each would identify as, like, we are more of, like, we grew up watching the original trilogy first, um, because that's what I did. I remember watching the kind of original three Star Wars movies all the time as a kid, Um, and, like, those are the characters, and that's, like, the era that I immediately think of when I think of Star Wars. I think of that first. Yeah, I like I because I'm I'm also of the era that I grew up right after. Uh, I watched them. I watched them. Um, you know, for at, for the first time at like my best friend's house growing up, mm. and so like that was my introduction. And then like right after that were like the remasters that got re- <gasps> yeah. re-released. So I was getting to see those in yeah. theaters growing up, and and yeah, that's yeah like such an amazing they, experience. I bet they have some of their own flaws as well of like where where Lucas was adding things that he didn't need to add in, but it was still like I was getting to see those on the big screen as they were coming out because. I was of that right age. So it's not I just like a quick throwaway line. I'm someone who like this is maybe one of my more controversial Star Wars opinions. I actually think that there are like one or two exceptions, but like I think pretty much everything George Lucas added in the remasters, I agree with. Like there are a few exceptions, but otherwise I'm okay with. But bringing it back to Attack of the Clones and the Prequels, it's interesting to watch them now for me, because again, like these ones I watched again. Even though, like, I don't identify with the Clone Wars era as strongly as I do the, like, a re- like rebellion era kind of thing of Star Wars movies. Where it is, like, these are some movies I remember watching in the theater as a kid. And, like, I, yeah, I, we both of us have watched, like, the Clone Wars and all the kind of expanded media that came out of those. And, I don't know, like, I think it's such a... Attack of the Clones in particular is such an interesting movie because I think... In all three trilogies, the middle one is such a big pivot point. And this is the one where, like, it does pivot so much, like, technically. Like, in tr- like I know it does from, like, one to three, like, two, a lot of stuff happens. But, like, it just feels so much less climactic and, like, important in a lot of ways. And I think that is, for me, where, like, I like what Clone Wars does. Because then it adds, then I, like, feel the consequences of it much more, I think. And and because Clone Wars is, like, excellent. It was fun for me as the final thing of, like, it was cool to get to see the characters that I know are, like, 
make a bigger appearance in the show or in episode three or just like are the weird characters that for some reason you latch on to as a kid right like i always loved kiati mundi like i always uh-huh. loved that cone chip like i don't know why like i just i mean because their character. action figure was way easier to get yeah. than some of the others and so like he was one of my favorites right and like i always loved kit fitsu and like he's such a cool like green octopus and like he's just dope and like these are the characters but like they get their real big screen time <laughs> their big screen time uh in this movie and so like it was cool to see them um and like the like all the characters like around the Jedi council who i know will have like actual arcs in the clone wars series and it's it was neat to see them being introduced here i like a lot of the seeds that lead to really cool things are planted here so even if this actual thing isn't necessarily that great to your point it is i think amplified by by what kind of sprouts from those seeds that are planted here it, that just reminded me. I uh, for those that think like Star Wars fandom toxicity is like a new thing. Oh no! I will. I will absolutely harken back to when In Sync got edited out of Attack of the Clones because they they were gonna be Jedi's in that like final battle, and that would have been like a super cool thing for them. Um, but like word got out that that had happened, and the like public backlash on that was just like fucking absurd so it got like pulled whereas like hey like daniel craig's in the new ones like just let them Ed have their fun in game cameos. of thrones and he gets like an actual yeah, like, like scene i mean people hated that too but, yeah but i'm saying like but yeah it's, it's like the like uh, that that just i remember thinking of that or like you're you just talking about that just reminded me of like that probably being the first big time i was introduced to the idea of like uh, like and and it was you know decades really before what we're dealing with now in toxic fandoms and stuff. But like thinking back on that and just thinking how like vocal that reaction was to that uh, is is like weird and absurd. Um, just to be like just like let them make the movie they want to make. Let them throw in the fun little cameos they want to make. God, stop being dicks, fans. Just it's- let them. I mean, like the mo- it, like in sync being in that movie would not have made that made a movie worse movie. <laughs> any worse? Yeah, it would. I think it's interesting for me to where I and I think more than Phantom Menace because Attack of the Clones because Phantom Menace came out in '99, so like the internet existed obviously, but like it wasn't really what it was. Whereas like I remember being on the internet by 2002 for Attack of the Clones. Like I remember that being a thing, right? And like I certainly by 05 for original stuff. Like I remember like reading all the time. Like I like ideas of like what episode three might look like and even like kind of like just thoughts afterwards in episode two and like it was beginning here so like that that's almost fitting that like that is kind of one of the first instances of it happening but also like i focus on the positive side of that where like that's also one of the first times i remember like me thinking like oh right like people are fans of these movies who have gone on to do big things right like people like and that it became a real big thing by the time of the sequel shows were like you kind of realize, it, like, all oh, right, like, these actors and actresses, they grew up watching these movies, too, right? And, like, this is a big deal for them to be in this movie or be in this thing, right? Like, especially, like, in Star Wars, where, like, it's been a presence in our lives for, like, 40 years now, where it's, like, yeah, like, literally generations have grown up and watched this thing and love this thing. And, like, why can't Daniel Craig be a stormtrooper or whatever? Or Ed Sheeran be whoever the heck Frodo the Hobbit in Game of Thrones? Like, <laughs> it's just, it's, like, I think... I always enjoy those moments of being like, all right, like, they're, they're people too. Like, they also like these things. And, like, they also, like, get excited and geek out over, like, watching all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, do you want to dive into your next one then? Yes. I also, so I watched Attack of the Clones. <laughs> and then I also watched, I think the actual name is, like, Dora and the Legend of, like, the Hidden City or something like that. I, it's the live action Dora the Explorer movie that came out in. Yeah. 2017 2018 um it's really good like i don't want to get like carried away like (laughs) because like it's like it's not a masterpiece but like it's very it's like really genuinely good like it is one where like i'm on the fence if i would give it like a seven five or like an eight um but like it's it's good to borderline great like and like the big part of why is that like they own it, right? Like, they're so self-aware. They're, like, anima jokes. They have fun with, like, the mythology, I guess, for lack of a better word, of, like, Dora the Explorer. And 
it works really well, right? Like that's the thing. Like there, there are so many great self-referential lines in it where they'll be talking and like my favorite one in particular, maybe is just like everything in the opening. Cause like the, the premise of the movie basically is that like Dora and her friends are like teenagers. Like they're like 16 now, basically 17. Um, whereas the show, they're like five and six. Uh, but the beginning of the movie, like spoiler for the movie, by the way, I guess the beginning of the movie is basically, they are probably the first like 10 minutes. They are like five or six and it's just them going on an adventure and in particular, like the first five minutes and how it opens is like such a cool thing. And right, like I didn't grow up watching Door the Explorer. I watched it because my mom's a teacher and like her kids did. And so I understand the things from that aspect of it. And even I was like, this is really cool. Like this is a really like they're very, they're owning it, right? Like one of the best parts is when they're still like young and it's Dora and her mom and dad uh, around the dinner table. And like, they're all just talking and like Dora takes a bite of her dinner and then she just looks up and goes, this is delicioso. Can you say, de-? and like looks at the camera and starts like doing like her actual thing from like Dora the Explorer. And then her dad, who's played by Michael Pena, just like looks around and goes, she'll grow out of that. And then she's like, they just keep going on with the scene. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember seeing that in a trailer. And it's uh, it is, it's Dora and the Lost City of Gold. Thank you. Yeah. And so like, they're just like the way they own that and the way that like <laughs> when she like becomes an adult, uh, Dora still just like sings to herself about like regular things like I've got a map I've got a map but now it's like you know it's it's my first day of school and I'm going off to school and I'm, I'm like having a great day and like it's very funny like the way that they like incorporate who the character is and I think it's also weirdly like a pretty good coming of age story as well like it's like part of me won't say like the movie's better than it is in your TV but like not nah, like this movie's great because like they made it great like they owned it like and they have so much fun with it, and, like, the villain and, like, the twist there is cool, and Dora's parents are both, I mean, Eva Longoria and Michael Pena, they're great actors and actresses. Um, and, yeah, like, the cast super fun. Uh, uh, I love seeing uh, Benicio Del Toro as Swiper. <laughs> yeah, and he does the voice, like, this. so the thing with Swiper is that, like, and it's, like, one of the best parts of the movies, like, so they explain everything and, like, how, like, what you're seeing in, in terms of, like, reality versus not. And, like, the, eventually, like, most of it's, like, when she's a kid, and then as an adult or as a teenager, it's, like, all right, cool, now it's all just, like, reality-based. Except for the exception of Swiper. They give... Swiper is a talking fox who is the only animated character in large chunks of the movie for no real reason. And it's just, like, they just... That doesn't matter. This is a talking fox. And, like, the best part is just, like, the the throwaway line, like, one of the characters has where it's, like... Did you, did that fox have a mask? That doesn't make any sense. Like, what do we think he's another fox? Like, why would he have, like, why are we trying to just, like, and, like, have this whole thing about, like, why he's trying to hide himself and doesn't make any sense. And, like, it's really funny. But otherwise, like, nobody mentions the fact that, like, also he's talking. Also, he's walking upright. Also, he's doing those other things. Also, he's just trying to, like, steal stuff. Like, they just kind of go past that. And it's really great. There's a scene later on that I don't want to spoil too much other than to say the way the movie will incorporate like there are instances where like it becomes like animated and both how they get to that point and also the actual animated segment itself is just great like it's a this to me is like the textbook example of, like how people should be making these kind of movies like how you should do a door the explorer movie or like if you did a live action like blues well, i guess blues clues are to live action but like a live action like bob the builder or something like that or like these kind of things like this is how you should do it because it's done so well. It's done with both, like, the people who made this clearly, like, loved Dora the Explorer or at least, like, you know, whatever um, and respected it to the very least, but also, like, recognized, like, yeah, like, it's have fun with that, too, within, like, that respect. And, yeah, it's, it's super fun. It's goofy. It's silly. It's almost constantly over the top, but in ways that I think really work. And, yeah, it's, it's a ton of fun. I love that, especially in the context of this is the week that the uh, the Avatar, the last Airbender creators, walked away from the Netflix Woo! adaptation yeah. uh, that that took uh, you know the internet by storm this last week because uh, Netflix apparently wants to make it a more like mature and adult themed version or something like that, and it's like, well, that's unfortunate that like 
I mean, like, I, I can appreciate that there is a place for that kind of adaptations as, as well, but um, I, I'm always, as I said, like, even with the uh, the Muppets example earlier, I'm, I'm always much more a fan of, like, clearly the the people have a, a, a deep love and, and respect like spot, for the yeah. source material, and they, they want to, they're not doing it just to put a new modern spin on it, they want to honor, you know, what came before as well. Uh, yeah. It sounds like Dora does that uh, very, very well. I would love, um, I could also say, as a final note, I could definitely see them doing a sequel, and I would love to see what that is. Because um, mm-hmm. it's definitely, I mean, like, it only came out in, I think, 2018. Um, and the actress they have playing Dora, like, is basically, I mean, she is, like, Dora's age, basically. She's, like, 16, 17. Um, so they could definitely, I think, get away with doing a few more of these movies while she's still kind of young. Oh, also, I remember this because I, I didn't get to say it earlier. So, again, like, there's, like, a 10-year time jump, basically, from, like, the, the first, like, 10 minutes to the rest of the movie. The mm-hmm. actress they have play, like, five- or six-year-old Dora, who, and then the actress they have play, like, like present-day Dora, they look so much alike. Like, I was, like, freaked out. Like, I was like, is that, like, her sister? Like, they are, like, very similar-looking people. Um, the person they have playing Diego, not so much. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the actress they have playing Dora, like, the young and current-day version of her, they look very similar, and I was very kind of like, oh, shit. Um, but they, I don't believe, are related. But yeah, like my m- my uh, g- given that I'm a 35 year old, my only real exposure to Dora the Explorer has ever been um, a few years back. I want to say College Humor did a uh, like a parody video of it with I want to say Ariel Winter from Modern, Modern Family. Family, I believe, was playing Dora, and and it was very like tongue in cheek. Um, it, like it, it was very much playing up to those aspects, but it was also like you know, a more mature themed version of Dora the Explorer, I think. And, and like, she's, you know, tied up or something and, and she's like in a hostage situation or something. So like, I don't, I, I don't even remember like the details of the video, but like I knew enough of the cultural touch points of Dora the Explorer to get a lot of the references they were making. Um, and just being like, okay. I mean, like based on this, yeah, I'm sure they could make something like a live action yeah. Dora the Explorer work if they, if they wanted to, you know, go over the top and have fun with it in that vein. Uh, and then when I remember seeing the trailers for this, I was like, okay, well, I mean, this definitely isn't going to be a thing for me, but yeah, I appreciate that, that Michael Pena bit of like, she'll grow out of that. <laughs> I think um, I, it, I will say like the movie's short, like movie's like an hour and a half long, like whatever. Like I do think that like some, I do think you could watch a movie and like enjoy yourself, have a good time. Um, Trev and even people who like just didn't watch or explore or have any exposure to it. Cause mm-hmm. it's still like, just like, it's a fun, like yeah, 17 year old movie. Fun, fun with, little adventure movie. Exactly. It's actually, a, a, as an aside, a surprisingly good, uh, like, adventure movie, as in, like, just as a note, too. And, like, this movie is shot so, like, it's beautiful. Like, they had, like, I don't know how much, like, CGI they used, but, like, a lot of it looks like it was just, like, on location in, I want to say Peru, and it is beautiful. Like, it's just, mm-hmm. like, holy shit. I mean, especially as, like, as somebody who, you know, obviously growing up with Indiana Jones and then yep. also, like, the Uncharted series, like, it definitely strikes me as, like, oh, yeah, that would be, like, Uncharted for kids, kind of, yeah, like, that kind really of adventure, or, or, yeah. or Indiana Jones for, you know, young Indiana Jones adventures kind of thing, um, so, like, sh- shout out to it, I, and, and, yeah, it's it's one of those things, like, hey, if I ever have kids, I'm sure that's a movie we, mm. we would watch, yeah. I, as somebody who has sat through Artemis Fowl, I'm sure I could sit through I, Door of the Explorer no, with no problem, nope. <laughs> Um, so, uh, well, very cool. Um, uh, back over to me, uh, I was telling you a little bit about this. Uh, so I finally sat down and, uh, last night while I was, you know, in that like six hour marathon of fall guys trying to get that damn screenshot. Um, while I was doing that, I also was watching, um, uh, Harley Quinn, um, the DC animated show that is now available on, uh, HBO mm-hmm. max. Um, cause I, like, I'd been hearing good things about it for a while. Uh, and I was still un like unprepared for how much I'm enjoying it as well as like mm-hmm. how much TVMA it is, like how mm-hmm. rated R the, the, the show is. Cause like right out the gate, like Harley's, you know, on a boat, like whacking like guys with her mallet and like bones are breaking and popping out of the skin and she's cursing up a storm and stuff. And I was like, Oh, I was, I was not. Like, I definitely thought it was going to play more with, like, the adult aspect of it, but I thought it was going to be bleeped or something like that. Nope, she is cursing up a storm. Like, the only things that really get bleeped are, like, the C word, which plays into, like, a storyline as well. And then, like, 
um, from an animation standpoint, like Maxi Zeus um, is out there and like he, he'll like flash his dick out of his toga and that gets like blurred. And then like he has like statues of him where also his penis is just getting blurred all over the place. But other than that, it's like pretty like it's not having a problem. Like I haven't I don't think I've seen any like boobs or anything like that. So I, it, I'm sure if that pops up or something, it'll also get blurred out. But like language wise and just like graphic violence it has no problem shying away from those things but it is also hilarious and mm. uh kaylee cuoco is uh is playing mm. uh harley um and it's it's definitely like an inter- like a different take than i'm i'm used to in part because of I'm, I'm so used to like uh what like uh, tara strong i think plays her in like the games yeah um, yeah. and, and obviously the Margot Robbie, you know, iteration has been, has become pretty iconic now that, and, and Birds of Prey also now available on HBO Max, I saw. Um, uh, and, but like also just whoever played it in the, uh, the Batman animated series growing up, like it's, it's a different version of that, but it's also still really fun and really good. Um, and she like, what I love about the series is, um, a, like, it's very much a, a Harley and Poison Ivy kind of story, and and Lake Bell is playing a very like sardonic Poison Ivy, which is a ton of fun, um, and and right up my alley. But then like she just completely surrounds herself with like D list and misfit kind of like other DC characters. Like her little squad right now, a few episodes in is like her uh, and Poison Ivy, obviously. And then, like, Clayface is in there, and he's just, Hell like, yeah. the saddest sack, washed-up actor, like, <laughs> punchline of a character kind of thing. Um, played and voiced by Alan Tudyk, um, who also, I think, does the Joker in this iteration. Um, and he's just having a ton of fun with it. always love seeing Alan Tudyk um, uh, pop up. Um, Ron Funches is King Shark, um, and he's, like... Uh, you know, a, a tech hacker kind of guy, but also, you know, King Shark. Uh, and then uh, Tony Hale is Dr. Psycho, which is a character I never, like, knew of or anything like that. Um, but he's, like, he's introduced fighting uh, Wonder Woman and, and part of the Legion of Doom and stuff. And he just, he's the one who, like, has he ha- has this, like, PR nightmare where he shouts out the C word and becomes like that becomes the worst thing he's done uh, instead of like the people he's trying to kill and all that stuff. It's like, Oh, he gets quote unquote canceled because of, uh, because of, you know, saying the C word and not respecting women and that kind of stuff. And so he's trying to rehabilitate his image by signing on with Harley. And it's just like, they are the misfit, like dumbest things. Kite man is in here and he's just like a hilarious like everything kite man comes in and does is a ton of fun and hilarious and it's just like it's clear that pe- the people making this love dc and love like D- dc deep cuts mm. and realize how absurd some of these things are like kite man as a villain as a concept in general <laughs> um and and like even the character realizes yeah i like i don't understand why you're relying on me for anything because like i'm like I suck. I know I suck. I'm just <laughs> I'm just presenting like overconfidence to make up for how much I suck. I yeah. get that. I'm not I'm not oblivious to the fact that I suck. Um, and it's uh, it, it's it's just fun how they um, how they are are having fun with this. And, and at the same time, it's like a fun. It's it's very much like what Birds of Prey was doing, where it's Harley trying to break out of the Joker shadow. Kind mm-hmm. of like that's her you know, overarching story and, and trying to be taken seriously as a, as a villain. Um, while Joker, like Joker is her biggest antagonist, really. Um, Batman, you know, shows up, Robin shows up and, and, and Wonder Woman and, and Superman is in, has been in an episode so far and stuff. So like the, like the wider DC, you know, um, uh, oeuvre shows up, but it's, it's very much like, um, Joker is constantly showing up and trying to thwart Harley and keep her under his thumb. Um, and uh, and so it's fun watching her, you know, constantly basically say like, no, fuck you, Joker. Like, you don't you didn't create me. You didn't make me like I, I am my own person. Um, and it's just, yeah, I'm having a great time with it. Um, and and the fact that it is so like hard R is just such a fun change of pace for like like. I, I enjoy stuff like The Boys or Umbrella Academy, um, uh, but those are, like, you know, riffing on DC and Marvel. 
so seeing DC like really get Actually, into yeah. it and and like own that kind of thing and do this you know different take on DC um, itself is just really fun and uh, the writing's great the uh, the comedy's great the performances are all great and uh, and the animation looks great too so um, definitely definitely highly recommend um, like I said I'm only a few episodes in so far but it's it's a ton of fun just watching and I look forward to just hopping in and watching more um, the I'm other excited. thing. I have been uh, uh, enjoying uh, a rewatch of is uh, also on HBO Max, uh, Doctor Who. Um, I uh, I like I don't know it, it, it largely probably because it's on HBO Max. I just saw it. I was like I haven't watched Doctor Who in a while, um, and uh, and so I've been really enjoying kind of going back through that. Um, I'm almost done with like the David Tennant episodes at this point, um, and. Like I haven't been rewatching like everything. Like I, there, there were definitely a lot of like Martha episodes. Where I was like, I remember this one. I don't need to watch this one. <laughs> I can skip <laughs> through this. Um, and uh, and so I'm in some of the Donna episodes now. Absolutely. Um, uh, and just yeah, like David Tennant, a ton of fun in that role. Yeah. Um, uh, so many like fun adventures. Um, uh, I look forward to getting into the math, Matt, Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi era because Peter Capaldi is. Like I watched his first season, but I never got back to his second season, and I haven't watched any of the uh, the new uh, the new Doctor stuff, whose Same. name escapes me. Um, uh, the the female Doctor, um, uh, and so I look forward to like now that that is all easily accessible through HBO. I look forward to uh, to eventually getting to those episodes, but uh, that was definitely like I. I got into it um, at, alongside like a, a friend of mine in the theater community, and we were just kind of like watching through that the the series together a couple years after it came out. Basically, during the I think we got on like late in the tenant era, and so we basically like caught up on all the episodes, and then we're watching like we went and saw the fiftieth anniversary special in theaters together, and and uh, and and watched a lot of like the Matthew Smith episodes and stuff together, and so um, just fun like reminiscing and thinking back to to that and then also just seeing what a fun little like time capsule this 2007 start i think is when the when the new series launched um like just like it was when we went back and watched like west wing uh it's just fun seeing like you know the technology of the time or uh in in many cases especially doctor who like the the CG of the time versus when they were like, eh, let's go practical for this one. And whether or not that was a good choice or not. <laughs> um, uh, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, hopping back through some Dr. Who fun as well. Um, so just a, a little bit of my TV uh, kind of going habits. Uh, uh, did you, so we're like, what's your history with Dr. Who? There, Logan. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I want to say is Jodie Whittaker is the name of the current Jody Doctor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I looked at that. Um, I love Doctor Who. Uh, again, we actually talked about this quite a bit when I went to come see you in Phoenix. Right. Because um, <laughs> I have like all of the box sets. And yeah. Stuff. yeah. Uh, and I have basically most of them for like the Tenet and the um, Peter Eccleston era. Um, Christopher Chris Eccleston. Eccleston, yes. Uh, the minister is like that's not right. Uh, Who also uh, like uh, in Doctor Who news, like it got announced that he's doing some big finish audio mm -hmm. versions, which is like uh, like uh, uh, almost unheard of because a Christopher Eccleston is like notorious about like like not revisiting projects and and not being like a fan centric kind of person. Yeah, like he like he hates Comic Cons. I, at least that's like that's the perception I got. And he was very much like. I'm doing this one season to help bring it back, but then I'm done. I'm not coming back to the character ever again. So he did not come back to the 50th anniversary, even though he was clearly like, it was clearly written for him to come back. Um, uh, so the, the fact that he's coming back to do like audio adventures as the ninth doctor is like, Oh, that's like cool. Um, yeah. The, th the thing I'd always read for him too, is that like, he didn't want to be typecast. So he just wanted to like be one and done. Didn't want to get like cast, like the doctor forever. Want to do other things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, so for me, uh, Tenant is my introduction, um, to Doctor Who, um, and I still firmly believe and think and always will, um, like David Tennant is, is the Doctor, when I think the Doctor, Who, I think of David Tennant, like he's my favorite Doctor, I love David Tennant and anything, everybody please go watch Broadchurch, not enough people did, um, but... 
Or yes. you can watch him in Much Ado About Nothing, which Logan also, and I recorded an episode of this also podcast just, on and it's really, uh, a David, couple months back. David Tennant is just supremely talented in everything he does, and his praises are not... Also, you can go see him in Jessica Jones. David Tennant's just great. He's yeah. the best. Oh, I love yeah. him. He's, 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 I mean, like, honestly, like, uh, apart from Loki, he is probably the best MCU villain. Um, I you know what and, and and you know even, what even I mean like even maybe above Loki because he's an it, actual especially villain. like in early day because he got so much more time to be fleshed out yeah. as a character versus like the very limited screen time that Loki gets but yeah the purple man he's he like just knocks it out of the park I might agree with that actually I'd have to think about that but I might agree he might be the best MCU villain um David Tint's great and like his doctor is very much like that personality and that kind of quirkiness like it's very much like me and I the kind of the stuff I love in terms of humor um, he's style goals. Come on, it's Converse for days. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like, I always loved David Tennant, and have gone back to that more than, like repeatedly. Um, him and um, Donna is great. Like their chemistry. Him and Catherine have just great chemistry. I talked about on the Much Do About Nothing pod. Yeah, um, I, was, I went back and watched her, um, their, like her reintroduction episode. So I think it was one I watched yesterday uh, in the adipose sequence, and it's it's fun, like especially like when you know what's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, them going through their like independent investigations, and then when they finally meet up and have that whole scene like, where they're m- silently mouthing yes. at each other through, <laughs> and they go through this whole thing, and then like finally it cuts back to the villain who's like just been just finished monologuing. And she's just like. Are you guys? Am I interrupting anything? And it's like, yeah, they were definitely like making a big old like fuss. So of course they're gonna get noticed. It's so good, and I mean like he. So like Don is great. Martha is Martha, but like I mean, I think like I I think it's unfortunate that like because Martha Martha gets like an unfair rap. I agree. And, 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 and I think, and it's it's largely it's. I mean, none of it is on um, Freema Agama. No, not at all. Like. Like she's phenomenal yes, in the role. It's absolutely. just like they they made her like so immediately like I'm in love with the doctor, but the doctor doesn't love me back because the doctor is still hung up on Rose, mm-hmm. who we got two seasons with. Like she was set up to fail yes. in the eyes of like Rose fans, and then just doesn't get a ton in the way of like great stories really for her year. Like I mean the the family of blood um, two parter is a great one um and her like i, I mean uh, I, I even uh, really enjoy like the her going back like the shakespeare episode um that they get as like her second adventure um but like even in that family of blood like that is like she's great in it but that is so much more about like david tennant being a normal guy instead of david tennant being the doctor and what that means and so like she's even a back seat she has to take a back seat to that story um uh, but yeah, so like so much of that just is is unfortunate. She gets kind of like looked over um, because she wasn't Rose, basically. I think part of it too, looking back retrospectively, is two things for me. Which is one, she's just sandwiched between two people with bigger personalities. Like Rose and Don are just such big personalities, I think, and such like dynamic characters. Whereas Martha is just more, I think, kind of understated. And then I also think it's the fact that, like, her, se- like, out of the three seasons of David Tennant, and then he kind of had, like, a fourth season, if you want to call it of that, just, like, four specials, basically. Um, hers is unquestionably, like, it is the sad season. Like, it is the downbeat season where he's, yeah, yeah he's it's, recovering it's from the Rose doctor the entire is just time. Very sad. <laughs> yeah, like, he's very sad, right? And, like, even, like, the standout episodes of that season, which I would argue are probably I mean, uh, Family of Blood. I mean, are and very blink. sad. It's it, it, and yeah, it's and also the season that has one of the best episodes of Doctor Who ever in Blink. Yeah. But well, I again, think Family like, Blood right is, there too, and like both of blink our very like, sad, yeah, weird episodes for the companion. Blink in particular is is that like that formula of Doctor Who where it's like they clearly needed to give like the main the Doctor and the companion like a light episode. Um, for their workload or whatever so like it's it's because it's that and then in the in the season before that you have like the the linda episode or whatever it's really good um which is like that's i mean that's just a dumb episode but blink in particular it's like so much is of that episode is carrie mulligan and and like her having this doctor adventure with the doctor and and uh and martha being stuck in 1969 um uh, but like it's it, so again like in that's another case where she's having to take a back seat to 
the the much better episode built around her, I guess, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I I think. And so, like, Martha, Martha's fine. And, like, again, that's my point. Like, she just kind of has things built against her. But my my big thing was that, like, Tennant does have my favorite companion and also my favorite companion relationship, which is with Rose, obviously. Like, it is... I mean, that... It's so, it's so well. Like, it is kind of the large overarching arc of his entire run, you could argue, right? From the very beginning all the way to literally the last seconds of his farewell episode i mean yeah it's um, definitely the it's definitely the russell davies arc <laughs> sure yeah and like I, I i like russell davies um i liked his kind of doc two era um mm-hmm. quite a bit actually and like part of it is to be fair is that like it was mostly also david Tennant's era um yeah. but like i love Tennant and rose i think to this day like david Tennant and billy piper just have i mean they just their chemistry is very very good um like i think they have some of the best chemistry of any of the companions and doctors um but yeah like i, I was never I, I, I yeah i don't know really I, I can't put my finger on it but i was never a huge rose fan and that's totally um, fine that's totally like legitimate too like there are people who aren't um but for me it worked really well um and like david Tennant's era is peppered with so many of my favorite episodes from the show um like the second and sir the second and fourth series of doctor who which would be his first and third are to this day still like two of my favorite seasons maybe my two favorite seasons of doctor who um and then i think he's got my favorite farewell because they, they were just like we're just gonna get like we we're yeah, wrapping yeah. up like four because like they're, it's also like the wrap of like the russell davies thing and like it's the end of like the master arc from like kind of two seasons and like they wrapped up like it is also like in a weird way like i wonder too if it was like it is a very effective, like, if the show were to just kind of get canceled by anything, like, they're wrapped up so much right there. Um, mm-hmm. But, and, like, and they gave him very much, like, we're going to get, like, part one is an actual episode. Part two is 10, 20 minutes for an actual episode, and then, like, 30 minutes of, like, you are getting to just do a farewell tour now. Um, and it, But it works. Like, it is, it works really well. I think you've put so much in a tenant, and his doctor is one that is, I think, so kind of, emotional that it is very kind of i think effective at what's trying to do his final scene with rose is great his farewell is great um and then matt smith came along and i watched his era and liked it and then weird enough it sounds like talking to you i left at the same point you left where i did capaldi's for a season and then i didn't go back to the, i didn't go back to him after that and i haven't gone for anything jd whitaker has done i didn't yeah. so part of my reason and i'll be curious to hear if it's the same for you is that like I love David Tennant, obviously. Mm-hmm. I can rant and rave about him all day. Matt Smith, also fantastic. I did not really love Peter Capaldi's Doctor. Um, that just didn't click with me in the same way. Yeah. Um, and then also because... I don't love Clara, I think. As men, like this, I, don't, I think she's a weird one where like people, I think, kind of can go either way. And people, I feel like, either really love her or really don't like her. And I'm kind of in the more of like... I think her initial idea is so cool. Like that reveal is so cool. And then afterwards, I feel like they couldn't really ever nail what they wanted to do with this character. Um, And then also I was beginning, I was beginning to get a little burnt out on some of the stuff they were doing. It was like happened at the end of the Matt Smith era too, but Matt Smith is just so great that I'm like, I don't care. Matt Smith is great. Um, Mm -hmm. But like, I think, River became a character who I became like increasingly less enamored with over time. Um, like I think her best episodes are still like her introduction with uh David Tennant and then like the first few times she was with Matt Smith. And that's that like I very much is like this is beginning to get like the reveal has happened, I know who you are, and it's I don't I don't need you any much really here anymore. Um but by Capaldi in particular, like his personality just didn't click with what I wanted. Um, I heard that like his next season is better and that Jedi Whitaker people seem to really like, so it's, it's like that thing of like, I keep meaning to like get back to it and I just haven't. Um, but yeah, I, I, I very much vibe with Dr. Who. Yeah. For me, it was, um, uh, like I, I love Tenet. I love Matt Smith yeah. and I really enjoyed the fiery energy that Picol- that Capaldi brought mm-hmm. as the doctor. Like I, I love cause that, and, and especially like, I mean, just the casting alone, sets him apart from matt smith and and he's old he's he's an old guy who can like be an old guy 
Um, and so I really liked Capaldi's Doctor. I think um, a couple episodes in that first season that he has are just some of the worst in the modern run where you have, like, the moon as an egg, yeah. as a very clear, it's like... Real bad. It's, it's, it's a beats-you-over-the-head kind of, like, um, women's, like, choice allegory, which, like, obviously, like... I absolutely support like women's right to choose kind of thing, but it just, it, it just is so unsubtle about it that I'm just like, Oh my God, this is like, it hurts because I, I expect it to, I expect that argument to be made in Dr. Who in such a better way. And then like right after that, they also have the, um, the like earth jungle or whatever, like, which is just a, a, a very like the same kind of issue, but with like eco-friendly kind of like uh, issues. And I'm just like, oh, okay, they've just lost any kind of like subtle storytelling in here. Mm. Uh, and I just, I, so I didn't have the patience for it. That also coincided with um, uh, my ex Catherine and I breaking up and like Doctor Who was a thing that we, that we would watch together as part of our relationship. So like as part of the breakup, I was just like, it, I it it I just lost an interest in going back and and kind of watching new episodes um as just kind of a side effect of that but I, obviously now enough time has passed that I'm I'm fine with it. Um as for Clara, I I like her by the end, but I agree that like the fact that the, that she's set up as a MacGuffin, yeah. it makes it really hard to make her a character yeah. from that is I think the biggest thing that hampers Clara. Um my, my favorite companion um, is is Amy, um, mm. Amy Amy and Rory like the the combination of the two, but Amy mainly. Um, I thought Karen Gillan was just a ton of fun in that role, and 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 like the the break and the split from the Tenet era into okay, this is the Stephen Moffat era with Matt Smith with Amy um, was like a good. That was probably the. I, I think that's probably about the time I came in and was watching the show on a regular basis as it was coming out versus having caught up on in DVDs or, you know, on the specials as they were airing during the tenant era. Um, uh, like the Matt Smith era was really probably where I came in as a regular, like, like when the rest of the world was watching it. Um, so that like, that's like, I, I obviously I started with Eccleston. So like technically he's my doctor, but Matt Smith is probably like, who I would identify most as my mm-hmm. doctor, mm-hmm. um, just based on like my watching habits and stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, those are kind of my, I think uh, a lot of the, the bullet points, but yeah. So like, I just, I, I, I echo a lot of like the, I was burnt out there. I had the whole like relationship ending thing that, you know, soured doctor who on me. And I just hated a couple of those episodes. So, yeah. so, so much. Um, at, while like, really I, again like really enjoying uh, like i i was watching the pompeii episode where um mm-hmm. uh capaldi you know was the guest uh star in yeah and like even in that like immediately i was thinking too how that like pays off and gets resolved in the capaldi era um because it was one of those things like when he got cast they said like we're not going to shy away from the fact that he has been in doctor who before like there is going to be a reason that the doctor has chosen that face. And I really enjoyed like how that gets resolved. And the, the idea that like he's a reminder of a time when the doctor chose to save someone, um, uh, like made, made a choice, made a choice to help, um, instead of just let, you know, Pompeii kill everybody. Um, and so going back and like rewatching that episode with Donna there and, and like how, well that message is really hammered home even within that episode of like Mm. save someone like you can't let them all die and and they go and and like it's it's you know very like the bright light come you know come with me if you want to live kind of moment that he has in that episode um just again like thinking ahead to how that you know comes full circle um was fun uh and and so i very much i look forward to seeing like the end of the um the Capaldi run because like I I don't actually I I, I, I love I love um like I I am not above um just hopping onto YouTube and being like I really want to see like I I really want to relive like the last moments of each of the doctors and the first moments of each of the new doctors or something like that and so I've like I've watched like the videos of those transitions and stuff and so like I like I've watched Capaldi's like last scenes kind of thing and the in his farewell speech and and enjoyed that going into Jodie Whittaker um, 
but I uh, well, but yeah, actually, it's, yeah, it's, I, I want to see that like firsthand, especially like I also really like. Um, I don't remember now if she got introduced in the in the Capaldi era or if she was introduced in the Matt Smith era, but I really like Missy um, as well. Like I, I loved that they set up eventually Jodie Whittaker's character by having the Master um, re uh, like regenerate as Missy. Um, uh, cause I like, I love, I, a, I love that actress. Um, but I thought she just brought such a fun chaos energy to that character. Um, and I don't remember, I guess she was probably in the Matt Smith era. It's probably where she got introduced, right? Who? But, uh, Missy, <sighs> the, the female master. Uh, yeah. Cause I feel like I've seen too much of her to, well, for actually, her to have she, only been first, locked into the one season with Capaldi. Her first appearance, I think actually was with Capaldi. Right? Maybe. Maybe. I guess maybe, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I like watching through Doctor Modern Doctor Who, like I, I very much look forward to just kind of continuing that journey, um, and seeing kind of the things that I haven't seen yet. Um, getting getting introduced to those new adventures and and I love that yeah, now now that I know how bad I hate some of those episodes, I'm not having any issue just skipping through them and just being like, mm-hmm. I yeah. I definitely know I don't need to watch this one, so <laughs> boop, skip skip ahead. Um so that's uh that's my Doctor Who thoughts. So let us um unless you have any uh, final Doctor Who thoughts, let's go ahead and wrap up with your uh, your update on Ghost of Tsushima. Yes, this is gonna be quick. Uh, we don't need to spend too much time on this. I've finished through the first act of Ghost. Um, and this game is still currently in my run-in for, to be my kind of final way runner for game of the year, again, with a caveat that I've not finished Last of Us Part 2, uh, but it's fantastic. I am, like, told, like, I am, like, this game's got, it hooks me so much, like, the world is beautiful, like, I love it, um, I'm all about it. I think the story works really well for me. I saw some people talk about how, like, they couldn't find it very interesting. That's crazy to me. I'm totally hooked. Uh, I want more. I'm curious to see kind of how the second act and the second island um, is going to go now that spoiler alert for ghost uh, we've rescued the uncle um, so he's I mean, free now it's like the the name of act one is rescue lord uh, lord uh, not lord sakai whatever it is like rescue yeah him, that character's name so it's like okay it's pretty it's a it's a pretty uh, safe assumption that that's how that act is going to end. But I see. I really really wasn't convinced, like, of whether or not you would actually rescue him, or whether or not he'd get like oh, okay. he'd get brought to like the next island castle as well, or like something would happen, or like he would get killed, or something would happen at that like kind of the actual closing. And, like instead, <laughs> like be you're a, just walking him, and he's just there. A, and it's like we're, we're sorry, Jin Sakai, your your uncle is in a different castle. Kind of like I honestly really expected it, right? And especially because like they like kept cutting back as you're getting closer to like the throne room of like him talking to Khan. And I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, he's going to show him like, be like, all right, and now I'm leaving and I'm taking you with me. And like him, like, and it's like, now he's just sitting in a room by himself. Just like when you walk in, it's like, Oh, okay. I guess. Okay. Um, yeah. so I'm curious to see like that dynamic now. Um, and like how the characters can continue to kind of grow the evolution of their relationship with Jin. But ultimately this game is great. It's beautiful. I'm excited because I think the second act, like the second chunk of the island is like, it looks like it's more like snowy um, and kind of like that kind of landscape. So it's going to be like a different kind of geographical thing as well. So yeah, I'm excited to kind of really dive into act two um, and just kind of roll around in this fantastic video game. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we, I joked with you a little bit before we started recording. It's fun. Um, like, doing this show in general um but in, in particular as it relates to ghost of tsushima because like I, i'll get to talk with you about like your impressions i'll talk with cam about his impressions and then you know cam is uh cam just finished act two not like last time he and i checked in on it so it's it's fun just getting to hear kind of where you guys are at as you progress through the game um uh, and and hearing kind of your thoughts on everything um who uh are you keeping up and doing all of like the the side character quests as you go or are you or are you just kind of moving forward with the main storyline so yeah i did the i could do it looks like you can do like basically like through part four at the end of the yeah. first second i did all that for all the characters except for the the only one i didn't was um the guy who like the like the merchant dude uh-huh um i didn't do his i was just like oh, i don't know I'm, yeah. I'm not bothered i mean he, he seems his very whole, his whole story he's only got like three three things yeah. to it anyway yeah so uh, yeah he's i mean like 
I think all of the the side stories are fun little diversions, and mm-hmm. uh, but but yeah, his is the the weakest. The ones that, especially because his is like you can do it all basically in that one act or something like that. Whereas like Lady Masako and uh, Sensei Sensei Ish, Ishikawa um, and Yuna, um, like the three of them, it's like yeah, you are told their story throughout the three act structure of the rest of the game. So like yeah, you don't you can't. You can't just kind of like work ahead. Um, uh, you you'll get like a chunk of their story here, and then a chunk of their story in Act Two, and then the the conclusion of their story in Act Three. Um, if you if you play along, so um, and and those are uh, certainly I think some of the like I, uh, like the overall story of the game I thought was fine, um, but their side stories um, and and the the character development that they have throughout is are are the things that I will probably remember most about that game, mm. you know, come end of the year stuff. Um I will remember Lady Masako's story more than I will remember, you know, Jin versus the Khan or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um so uh very cool. Um are you have did you dabble with photo mode at all? Are you having fun with oh, that or are you just I'm... like enjoying how freaking beautiful the game is? I have taken too many pictures of this game yet. Yeah. Um yeah, I have a bunch of those. I'm I'm sure I'll help, I'll put them in kind of any sort of written thing I end up doing for this game. But I have a ton, um, and is be- I also just like admittedly there are moments where I just like I don't even think about it because I am just like swept up in how beautiful the game is. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, just, I just come from stuff like marveling at it. It makes me like the this game is by an irony of like it makes me want to travel so much and I can't. And it's like this very like bitter irony where it's like oh, I've just never wanted to like travel as much as I do right now. Um, yeah, I, I saw to. tweets going around uh, that were like, oh, one of the biggest losers of 2020 is uh, the Isle of Tsushima's tourist yeah, uh, right. board <laughs> right now uh, because th- there are clearly a ton of people that w- want to visit Tsushima after playing that game. And I remember I, like, I like, one of the things that like you got very excited about was one of my early tweets on the game of like, I feel like 90% of that game takes place at Golden Hour. <laughs> um yeah. Which I'm sure you can appreciate more now playing it. Yeah. And and like I think I joked on on the show that like I I absolutely made that joke facetiously, but I also as I like continued to play, I kind of started thinking like I feel like they probably have like played around with like the sunset and sunrise like times of the day and night cycle, where I feel like they probably actually have like extended golden hour just to give you those more like beautiful vistas. Um, one little tip I will give you that's not really ever like explicitly stated in the game, but just given how much I know you like the game, um, apparently there is, uh, and I, I, I admittedly have not actually like checked this or, or looked into it myself, uh, too deeply, but somebody told me that there is a, um, like a hidden, uh, mechanic within the game that if you are if you you know behave more like the ghost and you're you know sneaking around, and I saw this, I saw this Twitter stuff. Thread, I think. That there is, uh, that the the weather the is changes. like reflects that and yeah. and is like you know rainier and and uh, and worse weather and stuff. So you lose kind of some of those beautiful vistas, and it you know it helps because bad weather makes it easier to sneak around and stuff. So it's it's like helping kind of your play style. But if you really just want to enjoy the beauty of the game, uh, that's something to to be mindful of as well. Is is it uh, you know travel the path of the samurai you can admittedly always like change the weather using the yeah, photo his mode. uh his flute uh um, oh, well right, yeah flute using too, photo yeah. mode or his uh his in-game flute you can basically like play the song that will make it sunny again or whatever um and it's one of those things like i i didn't realize as i was playing because i didn't see that thread or that that messaging until um after i had beaten the game already um but i did start like like thinking back it was i just like interpreted it as as I'm nearing the end of the game, the world is just becoming more, you know, tumultuous and stormy. And so, like, the environment I thought was just playing into that, I didn't realize it was probably because I was being more ghostly and, and, and whatnot and just going in and, you know, stabby, stab, stab, stab um, a whole bunch of bad guys. Um, so, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating little mechanic. It's it's one that, yeah, like, I wish was maybe a little bit more explicitly kind of stated. Um, but also, it, I, like, the third area of the game without like delving into spoilers isn't as isn't designed as beautifully as the first couple areas anyway Mm -hmm. so like i was i wasn't like inclined to really dive too deeply into like the you know beautiful vistas or photo mode Mm -hmm. or anything like that in that section anyway so it didn't bother me that the weather (laughs) wasn't great yeah um 
but yeah, I'm I'm glad you're enjoying the game. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's definitely. I was I was talking with somebody like in in terms of, uh, or, yeah, I guess it was probably actually last week with uh, with Cam and Frank because we kind of delved in a little bit into like game of the year conversation so far stuff, and um, like it'll be interesting thinking back at the end of the year on like Ghost versus Last of Us because I think. Yeah. I, like I think Last of Us Part Two tells a much more compelling story and has even like much more fleshed out characters and certainly is a is a beautiful game for the kind of game it's trying to be. But also like even though I spend more time in Ghost of Tsushima, like I think Ghost of Tsushima is paced better and is just more consistently an action game. Um, that like like if i were to sit down and and if you were to sit down and ask me like which of these would you rather play again right now i would say mm. ghost of tsushima because mm, i'm just yeah. like i like there's so much slowness built in intentionally into last of us part 2 that i'm not eager to really hop back into that kind of story yeah. versus like hey i can there's always something else i can go and do there's so, there like the open world nature of ghost of tsushima makes it a much more enjoyable fun game to play mm-hmm. than than last was part two right now so um yeah it's I, and like last was part two i think uh in the last week or so like they released a patch where it's like hey now you can go through and play on grounded and you can play with like permadeath yeah, things on right and i'm like pass hard pass and it's like you can like because there are trophies assigned to it and that was like i actually saw it like the night before like the the announcement came out or whatever i was on psn profiles looking at like my fall guys trophies or something like that and i saw like i was like why is my last of us only at a did they add new trophies to that and i go in and look and like yep they they've added two new trophies of like beat the game on grounded and beat the game with a permadeath modifier i was like well nope i'm i guess i'm just never going to be back (laughs) at s rank on that but then like if you really want, like, you can play permadeath, but you can play through, like, on the easiest mode, and you can play with the permadeath modifier of, like, if you die, it'll kick you back to the beginning of that chapter instead of, like, the beginning of the game. Like, you can absolutely do that as well, but, like, it seems doable. That Like, those trophies seem doable. I'm just, like, I don't... Like, playing on grounded is not fun for yeah. me anyway. Um, so I just have no interest in doing it. I, like, I appreciated that <laughs> the game did not include difficulty trophies for the Platinum this time around because I was like, I otherwise would not have gotten the Platinum of that game. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it'll be interesting, again, just like looking back at the end of the year on, especially like we, we talked again last week about this, but uh, this is the first time chatting with you about it of like, you know, this this is a year that has so many more heavy hitters mm. um, than yeah. last year. Yeah, last year was such a weird. But year. like, but I could still see, I could still see that nerdy sites game of the year like conversation being just as like diverse as last year's because some of these games are going to really hit you really hard versus Cameron versus Frank versus me. Like, we all have such different tastes in games that like like Ghost of Tsushima, you know, might be a front runner for you or Cam or both of you. Um, versus like Final Fantasy VII is still my front runner for Game of the Year right now. Um, ver- I but that like, came out this year. God, this year is so long. Plus, we're gonna get Cyberpunk, um, you know, uh, um, here in a, in a few months, theoretically. Yeah, I was we, gonna say. We'll we, see, I, yeah. I, I made reference to Halo Infinite last week, which obviously has been delayed out of 2020 since. But um, I mean, like, even Fall Guys, like Fall Guys is That's continuing what I was to climb gonna up say, my, like, Fall Guys is actually is, like the sleeper pick for like potentially being the consensus Game of the Year pick. It was, okay, I mean, it was like, for the same reason it, it was for it, yeah. PAX. Like it, and and it, or if it is, you know, because like Borderlands was our game of the year last year, which that you was know, so it, it weird. Happened. I forgot about but that. It, but it happened. It, like it was none of our favorite game of the yeah. year, but it ranked high enough on all of our lists that like, it, and it was the only game on all four of our lists mm-hmm. as we as we compiled it. Um, that it like it's also a very fitting game of the year for our team, even if we each had personal game of the years. So yeah, I could absolutely see Fall Guys. You know following that same path where it's like maybe it's nobody's number one but it's you know you know up there in the top five for enough of us or something Mm -hmm. and it just ends up shooting up and and getting kind of the like shooting past some of the other front runners that you would expect but yeah 2020 is like as as shit as everything else in the Mm -hmm. world is it's been a good year for games video games Um, man it's we're at we're having a good year um so shout out to that i'm really glad you're enjoying ghost of tsushima yes Um, so much uh, keep me keep me informed on uh, you know your your journeys through Act Two, uh, and then I look well. forward to because <clears throat> yeah, when, like you, me, and Cam, definitely I want to sit down and, and do a 
spoiler cast of of the game um Mm -hmm. when all is said and done so the sooner you guys can finish that up the better because it's definitely starting to fade from my mind at this point (laughs) i'm sure a little bit uh in the same way that like when we sat when we finally sat down for last of us spoiler cast or persona spoiler cast was like it's been like two months since i finished these things (laughs) at this point so i'm gonna try and remember the things yeah you know admittedly we talked almost we talked four hours on uh on freaking last, yeah. last of us part two so like we found plenty to talk about as yeah. i'm sure we could for uh for ghost as well but um yeah i hope you keep enjoying it um it, i mean it definitely seems right up your alley given mm-hmm. your uh given how deep you fell into uh assassin's creed odyssey yeah. and there's i mean even there's another one uh you got we got valhalla and uh watchdogs legion coming Fuck, up i forgot too. about that. this year's gonna be slow. yeah yeah i'm very excited be, for valhalla yeah it's uh, like Valhalla coming out what like two days now before uh, Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk right? is going to be rough for Valhalla. I think um, just like I mean it will like Assassin's Creed will as it always does. Or just Watch Dogs like, fans. Watch Dogs comes out like o- end of October I think like three weeks before Valhalla and it's like that's going to be it's, a it's shit one of those, show it's like, like month and a half. God. Yeah, it's it's weird that like. Um, and, and Avengers is coming out here, which could be a fun, like, co-op game for, for us to sit down and play. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, yeah, it's it, it's going to be just lots of stuff still coming out this God, year. God, yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, Legion, like, it's it's interesting seeing Ubisoft basically, like, throw Legion out there three weeks before um, Valhalla. Because, mm-hmm. like, is that enough time to get through that kind of open world game? Or are you ba- and and for the people who are going to only pick one of those two, you know, like versus like oh, if they were spread apart a little bit more, you might get people double dipping. Um, you know, it's 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 almost the um, was it like Battlefield One and Titanfall Two mm. from a few years ago, where mm. EA just kind of set both those games out within a week of each other. It's like, how is that a great strategy? <laughs> I feel like I feel like maybe it's not the best strategy, but. You know, whatever. Ubisoft has plenty of other stuff on their plate yeah. right now. So, um, um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's, I think, going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you, Logan, for sitting down with me, uh, chatting, catching up on, on all this fun stuff. Um, it's, it's fun, di- it's like, diving into Doctor Who with you and, yeah. and, uh, and Star Wars. Star Wars, and, too. You know, so many of those other, uh, the, the other topics we were able to tackle today. Uh, you can follow Logan at Lefty Logie. Anything you want to give a shout-out to, Logan? Um, stay tuned for Trevor's Fall Guys minigame ranking list, and then be sure to yell at him on the internet in a very loving manner about how you disagree with his list and how there are certain team games that are still too high on the list. Um, that's, that's fair. And, and they, might shift, they might shift around as I get more and more frustrated with some of the team games. But also, I think people are going to really hate how high I rank Slime Climb because I really like Slime I, Climb. So here's the thing. That was one for me was like, you know what? I agree with that spot. Slime Guys, because Slime Guys is fun. Like, it's a great challenge. Yeah, it's it's great. Like, I, it, the the kind of game I want more of most is more games yes. like Slime Climb. Yeah. Where it's like, it's that, it's a race, but it's also survival, um, kind of that mix. Because, mm-hmm. um, uh, it, like, it adds just an extra layer of, like, you can't, like... Yeah, you have to be fast, but you also have to be cautious and careful, and there has to be like a skill there. Um, so, like, uh, like it's it's interesting because like one of the things that sparked me doing the ranking was um, seeing our friend Ty from Uppercut went out there and po- and got like a thing on on Kotaku about how like Slime Climb is the worst game, <laughs> and uh, and it sucks that much worse when it's like the first game you play, which I've never encountered it as the first I've game. I've never so. either. Um, I, I didn't, I, but but I also just didn't agree with their um, their their opinion <laughs> that it's the worst game. <laughs> I really I really like it, and it's but I, I get I get why it's frustrating, and I get why it's a divisive um, mini game in there. Um, but yeah, uh, so like it, it, it's fun that like that kind of sparked like yeah I've played enough of this game. I want to do my own ranking <laughs> of all of these mini games, um, and then throw in the extra little uh, tips in there. So. Uh, so yeah, you can follow me at Trevor J. Starkey, and, and yeah, I will I will echo that. Whenever that goes live, uh, keep an eye out for that. Hopefully, I will get a goddamn game of Royal Fumble, <laughs> uh, so I can get that final screenshot that I need and get that um, uploaded um, and uh, and and into the article. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I also plug. Um, uh, we didn't have Logan on last week's uh, That News You Care About, so I got to I sat down with Cameron, and he and I talked about um, some of the 
Apple versus Microsoft stuff that I mm. uh, that is I'm sure like a weird precursor for what I imagine will be uh, this Logan week's topic. And I sitting down tomorrow <laughs> to talk about Apple versus Epic and Google or Epic versus Apple and Google, um, as that is one of the big stories of the week. I am sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out on that podcast. Um, uh, so yeah, all that fun stuff. You follow all of us over at that nerdy site. Oh, I also uh, will give a shout out to. Um, last week was the final episode of that wannabe film class. Mm, yeah. uh, ben and Chloe did their uh, their final wrap up episode. Uh, two and a half hours of them just kind of answering fan questions and shooting the shit with each other. Um, so definitely go uh, give that some love and and uh, and again thank you to them for uh, for sharing their talents and time with us over these last nine months. Mm-hmm. Uh, best of luck to them in their new um, uh, new adventures. Uh, Chloe with all of her, you know, growing Twitch streams and, you know, going out there and making moves, being on Inside Gaming and Rooster Teeth and all that fun stuff. Uh, and then Ben, I think it sounds like he's looking at maybe grad school. So uh, so best of luck to him as well. Um, so love to both of them and and go check out that podcast. You can follow all of us over at That Nerdy Site or check out ThatNerdySite.com for all of the latest from us. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, like, subscribe, share the podcast with friends, and maybe even consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thatnerdysite, where every patron gets early access to a monthly bonus episode of this very show, That Nerdy Site Show. Uh, This month's early access episode is me, Frank, and Cam sitting down talking about some of the things we miss most while we are in quarantine. Um, So you can go check that out if you are a Patreon supporter, uh, or everybody will get access to that here at the end of August. Um, and we got to start thinking of what we want to record for the September early access episode. So uh, thank you, as always, for joining us. Thank you for listening. Stay nerdy and be good to each other.